So, yes, today we're going to take something, uh, a slightly different topic. Uh, we're going to talk about electricity generation and we're also going to talk about cost-benefit uh, analysis and critiques of uh, certain interventions. Those two topics are kind of separate, but we're, but we're also going to put them together. Um, and then, uh, to the extent there's time left, we're going to do a little bit about the carbon footprint of AI itself. Um, a lot of what uh, I want to talk about today is kind of inspired by this uh, paper which is called Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning. Um, and what you see there is a table from it. So it's, uh, it was just put onto ArcSive in uh, 2019. And it's a big paper. It's like 111 pages. Uh, it's very big and it goes through. It's really a textbook. It's a textbook, but it's a PDF, right? And um, it is really kind of an encyclopedia, at least as of 2019, of, of different, lots of different ways you could uh, use machine learning to help with climate change. So in this, in this particular table, this is just the overview, and you can click on each of these sections to find out about it, right? We've got different application areas. So electricity systems, transportation, industry... Uh, all the way down to societal impacts, geoengineering. <coughs> Excuse me, geoengineering. And these are all completely sort of separate application domains. They don't necessarily have anything to do with each other, except that they're uh, working towards uh, mitigating climate change. And then down on the top, the, the columns here, you can see we've got causal inference, computer vision, interpretable models, NLP, time series, transfer learning. So the different types of machine learning that you can apply here, and the dots tell you which bit is relevant to which other bit, right? So a lot of the methods that we're, we're looking at here, a lot of different methods within machine learning, of course, and uh, we can apply them to different things. So I, I think this is a great starting point, like, up until this came out, uh, climate change and especially machine learning with climate change was such a new topic that there was not much of a guide. Um, this is a good starting point, and uh, it's connected to the climatechange.ai uh, community, let's say. This is kind of a website, and they organise uh, conference workshops. So if you're looking for what to do, uh, in this domain, then climate change AI is a good place to start. Okay, so some of the inspiration for what we're going to talk about today comes from there. And um, as I said in lecture one, AI, in most cases, AI isn't actually the solution that we're looking for because we're looking for reductions in emissions, we're looking for a lot of physical things, but AI helps to implement, to control, to manage the solutions. Um, today, we're going to look at electricity systems in particular. Again, this diagram comes from the, uh, the 2019 paper. Um, each of the uh, labels you see here is basically a different subdomain within uh, en energy and electricity systems. There's a lot you can do, and they're all, again, very different. So we could, uh, it could be forecasting demand. So forecasting demand obviously has a lot of social context, like who, who's going to be um, driving this weekend, who's going to be watching TV this weekend, you know, it's related to consumer behaviour um, and it could be as far as accelerating fusion science so that's a completely different domain, each one of these again very different domains in all cases we can use AI to, to accelerate some of the uh, better ways of doing things, right, so for the, for the energy system, which is a complicated uh, system there are lots of ways that we can uh, make things better. Um, we will talk quite a bit about renewable sources. I think I showed you this before. Okay, so there's been a massive growth in renewable energy, and uh, it's, it, the growth keeps growing because it's just, uh, yeah, 2022 was another record installation, especially for the Netherlands. Um, and I saw this uh, plot last week, and this is kind of, um, yeah, I think it's kind of astonishing. This plot shows you how many hours in the year the Netherlands produced more uh, renewable electricity than it used. 
So when you produce more energy than you use, you sell it to Belgium, you sell it to Germany. Um, but you're basically self-sufficient in electricity for that hour. And if we look at 2021, that's a very flat line because the Netherlands wasn't producing more than it needed. In 2022, it started to boost. And then, and then something, you know, the massive installation in 2022 has led to this massive generation in 2023. So, I mean, things are really changing, even just in the past two years. The level of renewable energy production is really, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I, I find it amazing. And this is, um, uh, so, this is good news. Um, but it also shows the importance of managing uh, renewable energy uh, resources. And as you can tell a little bit from that graph, and you know perfectly well, renewable sources are variable and they are distributed. Now, I'll show you this video. Is that right? Yeah. This is not very... Let's try the lighting. Now, if I change the lighting a bit. Okay, so here's um, the, uh, the cloud and the solar energy generation over the UK. And what you can see here is it's a composite. We see every time the, the screen goes dark, that's night time. And, uh, and then when it com comes through the day, you can see the clouds. Um, the actual uh, time is up there. And so each of these dots is a sol domestic uh, solar energy system that's been logging the amount of energy it produces. And you can see how much it varies from day to day. This is a very cloudy day. No one's producing anything, right? Uh, so everything stays blue. And then the next day... Things are a bit different. The way that these light up, so each individual point is someone's home, and, and whether or not they're going to be generating energy today, it varies massively, and especially according to the cloud cover, uh, which in places like the UK and the Netherlands is very varied. Yeah, that's a sunny day. Okay, so um, the other thing is that the grid was not built for this. So the grid was built back in the day when you just had a handful of power plants and the power just went outwards to everyone. Um, variable and distributed was not part of the plan. So actually that means that a lot of the system doesn't... Uh, the, 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 the things that have previously been installed, they don't automatically sense how much electricity is coming back into the grid from these things. So it may seem strange, but there's a kind of a lack of monitoring uh, in even the UK and the Netherlands, uh, rich countries, but the, the, uh, we don't have you know, these, these flows of data telling us exactly what uh, power is coming from which um, individual home. So one of the things we want to do is to forecast what's going to happen. Now, why is that? Firstly... The amount of electricity that you produce has to match the amount of electricity that is consumed because otherwise the, the excess energy in the grid, it leads to bad things. So if you are using more, then you need to produce more and that really has to be kept in sync. So the people who work at the electricity grid have to make sure this is happening, sort of live, they have to make sure that they're producing enough. If the production is variable because of renewable energy being variable, then uh, one of the things that we have to do is to sort of keep some backup power. Uh, so that's what I've drawn on the right here, spinning reserve. So there is uh, some, some, some fossil fuel being burnt just in the background just to make sure that there is a generator ready to go if the renewable energy dips. And so, of course, this, uh, this backup reserve that's still generating uh, uh, carbon emissions because it's fossil powered. And if we had better predictions of what's going to happen in the next hour, in the next six hours, we would know whether or not we're going to need the fossil reserve. So what we want to do is predict basically what I showed you in the video. We want to predict whether the, where, where and when the uh, renewable energy is coming from. And... Uh, in this plot, we can see what that kind of looks like. So it's a time series prediction problem. And uh, this, we show three days here. 
um, you can see a prediction in red and you can see the actual uh, outcome in blue. So, of course, we know that on the daily cycle there is a general pattern, but, but what the details are of that, it's actually quite difficult to forecast because you can see a cloud goes over something, a cloud goes away from something. There's a lot of very rapid variation. The better we can get these predictions, the better we can manage our uh, overall electricity system. So how can we do it? Okay, if we want to make short-term predictions of solar energy, well, if we think about the video, we're going to need to know the cloud cover, and that's forecast, right? So we saw a video of what the cloud actually was, but we're going to need to forecast the cloud cover. And then we put that together with simply the geolocations of our solar energy generators, and that helps us to give our predictions, right? So far, so good. Now, that's the plan, and that would be great if we had these two things, but neither of those two things are trivial. Um, I spoke before about uh, crowdsourcing and geolocations. Right, so we have, uh, here's a large solar farm, and you can see in this overhead aerial imagery, it looks nice and obvious. You may want to do machine learning to detect this thing using remote sensing. On the other hand, these are quite big and obvious, and I, I think... Uh, especially with crowdsourcing or possibly with government data, you can actually find out directly where these things are. The challenge comes when you have these tiny things here. I use this photo to illustrate. This is a street in London, and it illustrates the. if you were going to do uh, computer vision for this, it's actually a really difficult challenge because even just these three houses next to each other, they are all solar panels on top, um, but they look completely different. This is uh, solar panels on either side of a ridged roof. This is solar panels standing up on a flat roof. And this is solar panels lying down on a flat roof. And then this is complicated by the fact that, OK, here are some cars, here's windows. It's really difficult, actually. It's, it, it might not sound like it's uh, the flashiest challenge for a computer vision expert, but it's a difficult one. So actually detecting these things is kind of difficult. Is it important? Uh, in the UK, at least, and I'm sure it's the same in the Netherlands, it provides one-third of the installed capacity. It's probably more in the Netherlands, actually, because we have a lot of uh, domestic rooftop solar. So it, even though these things are small, there's a lot of them. It's, a, it's actually a big part of our energy generation. So that's um, why uh, we want to collect the... Uh, the, the geolocations of these things so that we can help to predict. I spoke about this before and I said that we, um, through a project in 2020, we created a data set of the UK data. Other people did it for India, for France. Um, and these are not exactly the same data sets, but, you know, maybe we can gather them all together and do useful things with them. Um, this field is moving quickly because uh, it, ever since I made that slide at the start of the course, uh, this other one came out for, for Germany. So now there's a, a data set of German uh, uh, solar panels together with um, high resolution uh, satellite imagery. So maybe that German data set could be very good for computer vision. And a big part of the software engineering challenge here is how we're going to pre-process those data sets. So those four data sets from the previous page, they all come in slightly different formats. Uh, you need to do your feature engineering and you need to be able to handle your latitudes and longitudes correctly, as we've seen plenty of times. Um, what I'm showing here is from our uh, UK data, we went through this process of we had, um, I know these initials don't mean much to you, but we had government data, we had uh, citizen science crowdsourced data. And one of the problems here is if you've got multiple data sets is that you could have duplication. So we could have a solar farm according to the government, a solar farm according to citizen science, and it's the same thing. So among other things, we have to do deduplication, lots of pre-processing. So um, if the total capacity is expressed as megawatts or gigawatts, you need to map these things, right? So there's a lot of feature engineering, a lot of software engineering that goes to create the final uh, usable data set. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
And what's shown here is the sort of uh, the citizen science loop in, in how we did it. So here's our pre-processing and we create a data set and then we actually feed back to the community that's collecting data and say, um, we'd like people to label this attribute of the solar panels or we'd like people to collect more data over here. So there's a whole citizen science cycle here and that refers back to what we spoke about last week. But let's assume we've got the data. All right, so now can we train a machine learning algorithm? Guess we'd like to. That's what the, the name, title of the course is. Is implying. All right, so we've got some geolocations and so on. Um, another problem is, in fact, the imagery data itself. If we wanted to do computer vision to recognise those solar panels. Um, this is a quote from some people I collaborated with. They need to load two and a half gigabytes of uh, imagery off disk per second. And the reason for that is that the machine learning algorithm, you know, machine learning, we have a deep learning algorithm running on a, a powerful computer with GPU or something like this. So there's a powerful algorithm. It's training. It needs to suck in this many uh, images per second in order to actually be you know, properly utilised. So... Again, software engineering comes here. It comes in here again because loading an entire high definition movie per second into the algorithm is not trivial. So I'll leave that kind of thing for your uh, software engineering uh, course. But it's difficult. And so here we've got uh, uh, this image shows uh, standard imagery from the Netherlands. So that's public data published by this uh, this uh, organisation. So 25 centimetres squared is about this. Uh, and then the number of pixels to cover the Netherlands. Right, so if we have it like this, then um, a standard solar panel is going to be like a 16 pixel square, something like that. And to cover the entire country, it's going to be a lot of pixels. It's going to be oh, 600 billion pixels. And we're going to want to process them all, right? So if we were going to analyse the Netherlands... Okay, so we've already talked about how we might do it. I'm not going to go over that again. So some of the, uh, this is a classic example of what we might do in, in remote sensing. We're, we're scanning imagery and we're trying to detect these objects, right? Fine. Um, I've put on the screen here just a couple of examples of people, of research papers where people have been doing that. And feel free to look at those. So this is, we don't know where the solar panels are. We train some computer vision algorithm to find them. But that's, that's only a step on the way to where we want to go. What we actually want to do, if you remember, is, is to make predictions about the solar generation. So uh, here's, here's the first step where machine learning might help to detect solar panels. And the second part, we actually want to do time series prediction. So completely different. So instead of computer vision here, we've got time series forecasting. Um, these are, well, it's, it's, it's a different situation, but I'm sure you've come across it before. We, we are going to train on, you could imagine, for example, that I train on the first two days and then try to predict the next day. This is the kind of setup that we're going to do in time series forecasting. Yeah, and I will show you an example. So if you remember the UK uh, video that I showed you before, oops, wrong button, wrong video, I mean, there we go. All right. So now what do we see? On the left is kind of similar to what we had before. Uh, now, NWP here means numerical weather predictions. So this is basically the data that goes into a, a weather forecast. It's trying to predict how much sunshine there will be. There is some sort of model making these predictions. So now weather forecasting, of course, has been worked on for a long time, and it needs to be very detailed to put into these kind of models. But basically, we're going to say, uh, whatever runs the weather forecast system, we're going to take those, and those are going to be input features to our model. So if I want to predict the solar uh, energy in a particular location, I'm going to take the, uh, the ir irradiance, so the sunshine prediction for that location, 
And that's just going to be a feature that goes into my model, right? So that's going to be a predictor. Now, this middle column shows you actually what did happen. The country is broken into pieces here according to the sort of energy generation regions. So all national grids are kind of broken down into sort of cellular regions. Um, and so that's why it looks like it does. You can see the actual generation, and it's very patchy and very variable. And then next to it, you can see the prediction. So we're taking, uh, we're taking this data, and we're taking the geolocations, and we're making the prediction here. Of course, it's very easy to predict the general. It goes up, it goes down. But then the variation, you can see, it's okay, it's pretty good, but it still needs improving. Now, uh, the thing that I'm showing you here is the uh, prediction that is run at, it is the prediction that is used in the UK national grid. So what they're going to do is they are going to be in the control room for the whole country's national grid, uh, looking at data like this to decide whether they need to uh, activate more gas generation or something like this. Uh, this is genuinely what is happening in the control rooms. And so what we want to do is improve this so that it gets closer to that. Yeah, any questions about this? Is there anything that's unclear? So that's about the, uh, the, the, the generation and prediction, sorry, the, yeah, it's more like the prediction of, uh, an, uh, of the solar power in order to manage it. I'll just quickly show you a couple of other examples that are where things come into sort of the electricity system, like completely different uh, applications of machine learning. Um, this is one uh, about wind turbines. Now, wind turbines, you may have heard, there can be collisions... Uh, uh, with bats and birds, and uh, some nature organisations have uh, raised questions about this. Um, we want to reduce it. You can see uh, this is pretty rare footage. Uh, we've got a sort of uh, infrared uh, footage here where there is a bat flying past, and yes, it gets past the wind turbine, but yeah, you can see they... Um, the turbines are moving fast, so it's not ob it, always obvious for a bird or a bat if and how to get past it. They're not familiar with it. We want to avoid that there's going to be any um, uh, fallout from that. And one thing that is done is to stop the wind turbines at the points when, say, migrating birds or foraging bats are going to be flying through. We heard of this. This is uh, it's it, it happens in in pretty much all the uh, with the wind generation when there are important moments for like wildlife are going to be passing through. They simply stop the wind turbines. Now that's a big deal, right? Because we are now not generating anything from the wind turbines. So it's 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 an expensive thing to be doing. Um, and let's see. This uh, we have some uh, labels in German here, but. If we, uh, if we don't pause the turbines at all, then, okay, we're going to generate as much energy as we like, or at least the maximum that we can, and then, okay, <laughs> whatever the level of um, mortality for uh, bats passing through, it's, okay, it's full blast. What is very common is to have a fixed schedule. So a particular time of night, we stop the turbines, we get a little bit less uh, electricity generation, but the mortality decreases. If we can do it automatically, then we can get even more mortality decreasing. We can really avoid the, the, uh, the bats and birds uh, collisions. And that, if, if we do it well, then it doesn't lead to any less energy. So, of course, this is better than the fixed schedule. Kind of an interesting question, I think, is how are you going to sense these animals, right? So let's imagine it's bats or birds, you're going to put a device on a wind turbine that's going to detect these animals. Uh, will you use image, radar, sonar, or audio? Just think about how you might do it. I, I'm going to ask for a show of hands just to see which methods are preferred. So this is for daytime and nighttime. 
on top of a wind turbine, birds and bats pretty far away, but we want to detect them. Who would do it with images? Radar? Sonar? Audio? OK, and that's, that's quite an even spread. I think radar was quite an interesting option, uh, yes. Um, there are different methods that are tried, and I think uh, the, the ideal would be a mixture of them. Image, I think, is actually quite difficult because by the time that you want to spot the animal, I mean, it's a long way away, and it's just going to be a tiny pixel on your image. Um, one of, some of the advanced systems that, that do exist, they use a kind of radar to detect objects nearby. Um, and then they actually, once they've detected something, then they zoom in and get a kind of telephoto image to, to decide whether it is, in fact, a bat or a bird or whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's not a trivial problem at all. But like up on the top of wind turbines, they're actually applying all these different automatic detection methods and uh, 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 trying to do it. All right, so that's one. Another completely different example. Um, smart grids and microgrids. Right. We only talked about the generation so far, but the, the actual consumption and use um, is a place where we can put some, some more intelligence uh, now, this image, which uh, comes from this paper, shows you a little bit of a diagram. OK, now we're on the sort of consumption, we're at a sort of domestic user side of things. The national grid is out there, providing some amount of uh, electricity at some kind of cost. And from the point of view of a very modern house, we've got our own, maybe we've got our own renewable energy generation. We've got... The use that we make, so let's say it, it could be, uh, well, things like TV that are not particularly related to any of the other factors. Um, you can also choose when to activate your heating or when to activate your high power units. Um, and then, of course, you've got storage. So if you have solar and storage, then there's quite a lot of decisions to make there. And because this is set up pretty much as a market system. So there is a price that you have to pay to, uh, to take some kilowatts of energy. And there's a different price that you can sell back to the grid if you've got excess. So now there's a kind of um, market optimization problem here. How are you going to satisfy your needs at the lowest cost or the highest profit? You can decide when to charge and discharge the battery. You can decide when to buy and sell electricity. You can decide whether to consume electricity or whether to wait with the uh, washing machine. So all of these things, I mean, this the, uh, uh, the sort of domestic electricity situation, even just at the domestic level, has become more and more complicated. And making the right decisions in these situations is not trivial. Uh, so, yeah, we can apply machine learning. Um, in fact, the method here is quite nice, but it uses reinforcement learning. I won't talk about that right now. If we have extra time at the end of the course, we might come back to the actual algorithm used. But you can see here, even for a domestic consumer in this country, there is quite a, a, a good argument for, for, for having some smart uh, uh, control of these things. The same happens if we're off-grid. So if we're in some... Uh, well, not in the Netherlands, but somewhere else where we're off-grid, you can take away that uh, external grid, and still, we've got, we've got an optimization problem here. How can we make sure that we're not going to run out of energy um, uh, you know, in the op optimal way? Um, I, don't know, I, I don't know if we've come across re reinforcement learning. Who's, who's aware of reinforcement learning? It's a bit different. Oh, wow, that's a load. Okay, great. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Have you, have you used reinforcement learning? No. Okay, fine. So, but, but it's come up. So anyway, th this is a nice application of it, and I think it's, it's kind of ni uh, uh, nice to look into it. Uh, I, guess, I guess you might have heard of reinforcement learning now that it's used for um, uh, AlphaGo and things like that, I guess. Uh, yeah, kind of everywhere now. Right. So those are a few different ways in which we can use uh, machine learning to make a difference in the electricity grid.
Microphone on. The microphone on, yes. Um, so maybe they're not going to tell you, but uh, you could measure how many computers you sell to Google, and that might tell you implicitly how much uh, carbon is embodied there. So, two very different ways, from the inside and from the outside. And these things can be very hard to get exact numbers for. We need to estimate them. As you saw on the previous slide, the magnitude, the orders of magnitude of these things can vary massively. So the most important thing is to, is to get a good estimate of the order of magnitude of these things. Even if you don't get an exact number, those kind of estimates can help. So um, let's try and itemise the carbon emissions used in developing a model, an AI model, so I mean uh, in training it and making sure it works, versus deploying it. So that's running it and monitoring it. So uh, I'm going to put this, let's say, let's put this on here. Um, yeah. So this is for developing and this is for deploying. Okay. So in terms of carbon footprint, uh, let's let's make a, a quick list. What kinds of uh, what kinds of uh, what shall we put on the list for training an algorithm? Carbon footprint. Yep. Okay. So. Uh, Anything else? Uh, mm. Yeah, so I'm going to write that down as data center. Uh, yes. Yeah. And the data center costs, you, you have that for development. And you have that for deployment as well. Yep. Anything else for development or for deployment? Well, I've already mentioned the embodied carbon. So embodied essentially means, or embedded, yeah, embedded. Um, so the embedded carbon of the... Um, uh, of the computer equipment, so all of the carbon that, that is used in manufacturing it. And that goes for both as well. So there's a few different things going on here. Some of, some of the things w are, are, are incurred at development stage, some of them are incurred at deployment stage. Some of them happen once, some of them happen lots of times. So... Um, the, the, the training a model, uh, maybe it will happen once, optimistically. What else have we got here? Okay, so, yeah, two other things which I didn't have on this list. Uh, one is cooling the servers. That actually takes uh, a significant amount of energy. And the other one is the cost of transmitting information. So... Transmit, you know, on the internet, uh, you know, information seems to travel freely, um, but it's not actually free because, of course, we have to pay for our broadband and so on, and everyone does. And there is a carbon footprint, and so if you take the carbon footprint of the whole, uh, let's say, um, uh, internet uh, backbone, and you can spread that carbon cost over all the information that we're travelling, there is for every email, for every piece of data you know, a small carbon footprint, and that needs to be added on. So all of these things go together. Now, important question is, how often does each of these run? So I've, I've separated it into development and deployment. Now, I'm a researcher, so I do a lot more development than deployment, right? So, so my carbon footprint is, is, is doing this a lot, and the deployment doesn't happen very often. If I was working in industry, I might do the development not very often, but the deployment 
if my algorithm has a million customers using it every day, that's a heck of a lot of uses. So the, the, the balance of these things really depends on the use case. And to make it more precise, right, so here we have the power usage of training a machine learning algorithm. Right, so of course it depends on how long the training takes. Now, you've seen it yourself, sometimes it takes 10 seconds, sometimes it takes two days. We measure it in hours times the number of processors times the power consumed per processor. Now when your processor is maxed out, we can kind of assume that it's, it's using its official uh, maximum capacity. So you can simply, uh, you can find these numbers in the sort of statistics for your, uh, your, your processor. So actually, we can actually directly work this out. So the, the power usage, which is in megawatt hours, is simply the time times the power. And there's another factor, the PUE, which is a, uh, a multiplier of about 1.58. This is... Just a nice, uh, 1.5, it varies, but this is a good example. Um, and this is about all of the other stuff that comes in. Now, it becomes a bit of an estimate here, but when we're running our algorithm in a data center, so this is if you're running on Amazon Cloud or Microsoft Cloud or Google Cloud, right? So they are running a data center for you, or if you have your own data center, whatever, Still, there is some kind of factor which is basically comes like a multiplier. So if I'm running my uh, algorithm this much in terms of carbon footprint, then there's something like a 50%, 58% extra, which is the carbon footprint of all the cooling and other things needed to keep that thing going. So this uh, value is not trivial, right? An extra 58% is not trivial. Uh, it's something that we should always remember in the process. And so to turn that power usage into carbon impact, well, okay, power isn't carbon impact, but we can, we, we can say for a particular, day, uh, sorry, a particular energy source, it has a particular carbon intensity. So these are things, again, these are statistics that you can find out. If I'm going to burn coal to make electricity, what is its carbon intensity? How much carbon uh, equivalent do I emit per megawatt hour? If it's solar, how much carbon equivalent do I emit per megawatt hour? Right, so these can be standard numbers, but they can vary. And so directly there, right, you can go from how many hours did my algorithm take to train to a kind of estimate or measure of what's its carbon footprint. Now, uh, you might not have all of these uh, data. So the, the power usage, that's basically what's going on at the data center. And if you can control the data center, improve the data center, then you can improve this part of it. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, the carbon intensity of the energy, that's, of course, the responsibility of the energy provider. And you can change energy providers, but it's, it's, it's there that you would make any improvements to that part of it. So here's some examples. This one um, shows the carbon footprint of a kilowatt of electricity. Oh, sorry, no, 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 not a kilowatt of electricity. Um, this, is, this is the example of the full system. So they're training BERT. I, I, we've probably heard about BERT. It crops up in NLP. Um, so this is about training the BERT model. And that calculation from the previous slide, how does it play out in real life? In different countries, it varies. If you think about Germany, Australia, Central United States. So this, this slide is, uh, I don't know, let's see, two or three years old now. But um, still, Germany, Central USA, Australia, what do they have in common? They burn a lot of coal. And that's why they have the higher carbon footprint for um, electricity and thus for the AI. And, of course, it varies through the year. Uh, this is the starting from, um, well, January through to December. And if we look at Western Europe, so the, car the, the carbon footprint of training our algorithm, as the days get sunnier, the carbon footprint goes down because we have more renewable energy. So it varies according to place, it varies according to time, and that, of course, makes things harder to calculate. We'd like it to be a fixed number if we want to calculate it, but it's a bit tricky. 
This slide shows a similar thing coming from Google's data. So Google's own data centres, basically where it's green is where they are um, uh, carbon-free energy, they call it. Excuse me. And, uh, and so, yes, it varies by time of day and it varies according to where you get the energy from. So one of the things they want to do is kind of optimise when and where they use the energy. The headline about uh, AI taking five uh, cars worth of, of uh, carbon came uh, from one of the original attempts to quantify this. So it came from this paper by Strubel et al. And uh, you can see here we've got uh, the uh, air travel. OK, we, we don't see all the details. But anyway, we've got the carbon footprint of an average car and so on, and then NLP pipeline. Um, and that's where they got this, uh, this estimate, this first estimate, that it cost uh, as, about as much as five cars in their lifetime. Um, so, how does this happen? Well, firstly, OK, we've got the car here, the, including the fuel and the embedded emissions, £126,000 of CO2. Uh, the NLP, running, training one model, takes 39 so actually what they've done in this paper, they're taking something like BERT where you're not just training one model, but you're running a whole process to train the model lots of different times, different hyperparameters each time. So we're actually training the model hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Right. So they take this number 39 here, multiply it by quite a lot based on um, knowing what the optimization algorithm was. And that's where it comes from. Um, the number has been criticised for various reasons. It's fine to say that, OK, this optimization pipeline, including the hyperparameterization optimization, can take a lot of uh, energy. That's absolutely fine. And then you see how the headline ends up, say, training a single AI model. It's not quite what the headline says, but it's, uh, yeah, so we, now we understand what's going on. Um, but this was a first estimate, and it's not a great estimate, I must say, but, but things have moved on since then. There's, 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 there's better data now. Um, there's this paper from Google themselves. Uh, if you take that uh, as a good sign or a bad sign, but the, they, in 2022, wrote a kind of update based on their own data. Um, it include improvements. So the model... Um, they changed their uh, actual algorithm so that it was an algorithm that ran in 4.2 uh, times less time. They improved the machine. They have their own TPUs instead of GPUs, and that makes... Uh, they've, you know, they've got more power-efficient um, uh, tensor processors here, 13 times lower. The data centre themselves, so Google um, manages and runs its own data centres, they were able to make more efficient data centres. And so that means that this usage uh, factor goes down. They've reduced it to that much. And they've also invested in some uh, renewable electricity sources and also this kind of scheduling to say, let's run the algorithms when it's better. So their, uh, their uh, carbon footprint per kilowatt has gone down. The really important thing about all of these calculations, if you think back to the first calculation that I showed you, it's multiplying, right? It's multiplying all of these things together. So if you can make even a little improvement on all of these things, and here they're, they're making pretty good improvements on all of these things, you end up with a massive difference. Relatively to their earlier work, they've got a 700 times lower carbon footprint, which is it's fantastic. Um, so that's just one example, and that's Google talking about themselves. So, you know, you can, uh, you can be sceptical about that. But it does show how all of these considerations go together. One of the things that we can do is log um, the, the, the carbon footprint of an experiment. So this, uh, yeah, okay, so this experiment impact tracker. I don't think it's actually used very commonly. But it's a nice idea, which is that you can implement a little bit of code and it says, you know, every time you run your training algorithm, it's going to make a little note of when it was and how long it ran and, and what the sort of cost of energy was at the time. And then when you've finished your experiment, it sort of automatically outputs this statement. It says, 
we use this much electricity, this much CO2, and so on. And it's, so that's specific to where you ran the code, specific to when you ran the code, and of course how much uh, training you ran. So it's a nice idea. And this is about the whole experiment, right? So it's not just about training, it's not just about inference, it's not just about evaluation, it should be the whole thing. And that's what we want to do, we want to evaluate the whole life cycle. Let's see. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, given the time available, but if you wanted to train a CNN for uh, um, a small business, what could you do to reduce the footprint? Just take a moment to think. So we've been through some examples already, and the examples from that Google paper could be one thing. But, you know, a small uh, business, for example, they probably don't control their own data center, so they can't do things to the data center. You know, there are things that are available, things that are not available. Um, if we're thinking at this uh, small business scale, there are still lots of things we can do. So uh, we can have uh, more efficient uh, CNNs, uh, convolutional neural networks, we can change the hardware to more efficient hardware. It's, it's worth mentioning that, of course, throwing away your old hardware and buying new ha hardware has this embedded carbon footprint uh, aspect, so that has to be considered. But it's pretty common that uh, upgrading the hardware or you know, changing your provider so that they have more uh, modern hardware um, can make a big difference to the... Uh, yeah, here we are, performance per watt. So, so the, the magnitude of the difference can be massive. Ah, yeah, you can use uh, green energy, of course. Uh, but there's actually quite a lot. So we can use pre-trained models. That's something that we've spoken about, and that means that you don't need to train so much because we've got a pre-trained model. It already exists. We're just going to train it a bit more. So actually, the machine learning strategy relates to the carbon footprint. Um, we can use smaller algorithms. We can use a single algorithm rather than an ensemble of lots of algorithms. Lots of things going on. Um, don't produce outputs you won't use. So we have, you know, if we have these monitoring situations where we've got lots of images, lots of audio, we can just run the whole thing through the, uh, th the algorithm. But maybe it's more efficient to say, I'm not going to run the analysis until... You know, I've selected my data points to be analysed. Lots of ways that we can do it. There's a list. Coming to the uh, summarising uh, stage, basically, it's all about the cost versus the benefit. And so what's the, in, in CO2 terms, what's the carbon footprint of our algorithm, as we just spoke about, versus what are the benefits, right? So if we're thinking about AI for biodiversity or for climate change, Essentially, we're aiming to make this, uh, this as big as possible, this as small as possible, and as long as the gain is positive, we're not doing a bad thing. Right. So it's all about accounting those two things. And I've said it before, AI is not the solution, but it can help to monitor these solutions and uh, hopefully part of the picture. And that is why we spoke today about cost-benefit at the same time as speaking about uh, the electricity sector. So think about, like, right back at the start of the lecture, we talked about different things we can do in the energy sector. Now, of course, it's, uh, the energy use of our algorithms is going to be part of the equation. So if I'm going to implement an algorithm and it's going to be running on everyone's, um, let's say, in any, well, everyone's smart homes or everyone's solar panels, and not making a big difference to the, the carbon footprint, okay, there's a bit of an issue there. So that's why these things come together. We talked about the electricity sector and the carbon footprint of AI.